you're listening to the Prepper Recon Podcast. For questions, comments, and podcast archives, go to PrepperRecon.com. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. Ready Made Resources is a trusted name in the prepper community because they've been around for 18 years. They offer great prices on night vision, water filtration, long term storage food, solar energy components, and provide free technical service. Get ready for an uncertain future at readymaderesources.com. Hey, preppers and patriots, this is the second half of my interview with Brad Harris of Full Spectrum Survival. Enjoy the show. You talked about economics for a while. Uh, Brett Bart had an article that said 15% of Venezuelans are depending on garbage to survive. Is is America immune from that type of economic collapse where where people would be eating out of trash cans to, to survive? Absolutely not. What we're seeing right now is that because the global alliance is truly upon the USD, which we all know is a, a failing part of a failing global economy, it's only a matter of time until either another economic power comes to rise or the USD deteriorates with the rest of the global war, you know the global economy. So when that point comes, then you'll see riots here, you'll see uh, food controlling, medicine controlling, just like you're seeing in Venezuela. The reports that we're seeing show that gangs of people, gangs of those with power and with enough arms, have controlled areas of food and they've they've started to anytime someone tries to move food, the government tries to move food or anything happens, they're attacking those areas and taking and hoarding that food for themselves. So you'll see the exact same thing here in the US. So it's already it's it's when you have a collapse of a of a government or or an economy, you usually see these these regional warlords that will rise up and and sort of fill the 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 power gap there won't they absolutely yeah that that will happen here and then and that's what we're seeing in uh, in venezuela not just venezuela but the congo um we're also seeing it in, in some other third world countries where this is just commonplace now the thing is here in the u.s there is definitely a buffer between that type of overt action uh in third world countries, that type of group is just a part of normal society. So where here in the U.S. we have small gangs, things like that, that, are, that aren't really a push for safety and concern, but you will see them grow. And after a general collapse, after you get the rioting, the unrest, uh, the martial order, that's when you'll start to see people rising to power. That's when you'll start to see these groups begin to use their numbers and use their arms to go out and actually gather these things. And one thing that's on our radar list as a trigger event is when we start to see ambulances being robbed at gunpoint, you know, someone will call out an ambulance to then take the goods and take the medication. That's when we know another tier of the collapse has happened. And is that happening in Venezuela? Oh, without a doubt, there's armed guards on on any any sort of ambulatory rescue. And that's if you can get it at all. But if you are in an area where you you have access to medicine and hospitals. There's hospitals that have already been raided just for their medication. And uh, how much of Venezuela's problems would you attribute to socialism and how much of it would you attribute to corruption or is it just the, the perfect storm of socialism and corruption? I think it is more of a perfect storm. And I think that at the root of it, you have human survival and that – main basis for survival is what you'll see no matter what country becomes affected by a by a devastation uh you will see gangs get together you see you see it in syria today not only are there religious extremists that have been western backed of course that are going and making moves within the country you also have entire neighborhoods that have grouped together and have sort of built their own minor colony of protection and some others have banded together with religious extremist groups and been able to move out. So you're going to see this no matter what country you're in and no matter what your uh, social class is, no matter what your governance of law is, you're going to see the same style of breakdown 
chaotic rise up, and then eventually totalitarianism or tyranny. And then I think they're kind of hitting the stages now to where there's just very, very little food at all. But over the past couple of years, as we've seen it deteriorating, uh, they implemented uh, control that, that you, you mentioned earlier, um, where you were yeah. rationed the amount of food that you could purchase. And that was, that was uh, controlled with fingerprint scanners. So in the event of that type of an economic breakdown in America, would we see that same type of, uh, of control where you're only allowed to purchase a set amount of goods and, uh, and, and also they're, they're not allowed to, to store up food at this point either. Is that something that, that you think we would see in America if we had that type of a breakdown? Well, if we take a look just at pen, at publicly available pandemic planning, that type of, structure is already in place where you'll have manned and armed uh, distribution points that are armed by the military. You'll have martial order. You'll have uh, food banks that are similarly handled. So it's without a doubt in our mind that that will happen. No ma- you know, That's in a method of preparedness for the government and continuity of government, no matter what the disaster is. We've covered a lot of problems. Let's talk about solutions for a little while. What's your advice for the new prepper who's just starting out? And is this something that you got to keep in the, in the back of your mind when you're when you're preparing? You need to be thinking about, huh? There could be a day where I'm going to have to go stand in line for eight hours to get a a, a five pound bag of cornmeal. And they're only going to let me buy one bag. And right now I can go buy all the cornmeal I want. I can buy all the rice and all the beans that I want. It's only limited by my ability to to find a, a decent place to store it. Is yeah. That- if, if somebody is starting right now, our biggest advocation to them is begin with the rule of threes. So uh, the rule of three states that a person has three seconds to make a decision when faced with superior arms or a violent interaction. They have three uh, minutes without air, three hours in inclement weather, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So as you walk your way up the rule of threes, you can start making preparedness plans based off of that common knowledge. Um, if I were to give somebody something, a bit of advice today, that would be to not let another day pass without having a solution to water filtration and having some food stored. Um, water filtration is an easy one. Anybody can go down to their local China store and get a $20 Sawyer mini filter. These are capable of filtering 100,000 gallons of water. They can be attached to a two liter bottle. They can be used on a little bit larger family scale. They only cost $20. It's something that we have in every one of our go bags. And I think everyone should have in their home and in their go bag. And then while you're there, get the white buckets for three to five dollars. Make sure they're marked HDPE2 on the bottom. That means they're food safe. They're five gallon buckets and fill that up with rice. So if you have your water filter and you have your rice, that's a great place to start. And now you can start actually building uh, to survive in the event of a disaster. People were, there were, this was back in the earlier stages of the breakdown of Venezuela, but there was, there was uh, footage of people hijacking trucks, risking their life for a 20 pound bag of rice. And it's, it's $8 at Walmart right now. Right. So I mean, is it, is it what's it, it, that's a decent trade off, right? Eight dollars versus risking your life. I mean, that's uh, pretty pretty easy to to call a decision. That's something that I think everyone can do. Um, putting rice away and something that you can filter water with. And, and people have to remember that death caused by uh, waterborne disease is more. There, there's a higher number of people that die from waterborne disease than all the wars and all the violence combined across the entire world. Every year there's more people. It is without a doubt during a collapse your first problem because you have to drink. And if you don't drink, you will die. So having a way to to filter your water or knowing that you need to boil it for a minimum of three minutes, without that you're going to be stuck or you're going to drink tainted water and you're going to sick you're you know you're going to get sick with diarrhea so that's a, a huge point that i want to make to everyone is eight waterborne disease kills more people every year than all the wars and all the violence combined and without a way to filter or treat it 
you will die. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Katie Armor offers affordable body armor, including level three trauma plates made of AR-500 steel. They can endure multiple rounds from pistols and rifles up to 7.62 NATO. Order today from katiearmor.com. That's C-A-T-I armor.com. In the new book, EMP, The End of the Grid as We Know It, by Cal Wilson, America is hit by several simultaneous EMP attacks, and the country becomes a wasteland. Jim Burkett is on a business trip when it happens. Will he make it home to his family? Buy your copy from Amazon.com and find out today. Get prepared before disaster strikes. PrepperRecon.com offers Molly-compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug-out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, EMT shears, suture kit, steri strips, tourniquet, tough strip bandages, and so much more. Kits are available in OD Green, Coyote, Black, and ACU. $99 includes shipping. Go to PrepperRecon.com and click the store tab at the top of the home page. Order today before it's too late you have a fairly advanced skill set in bushcraft is that right yes um what are some good resources for locating wild edibles is there is there a a good uh, website that you'd recommend or a good guidebook and uh and uh, most of our listeners are going to be uh either in america or maybe uh, some southern parts of canada but uh what are some good things that that we can find in America that that are easy to locate as far as I'll tell wild you what, edibles? Wild edibles really are everywhere. I would suggest everybody go to uh, YouTube and search "Eat the Weeds" with uh, Dean Green. He has a great series with very detailed instruction on how to identify wild edibles, and he also shows you you know himself eating them, which is, I think is a big part of it. But if you're going to rely on a book, I strongly suggest everybody. Find one that works for them uh, within their area because a lot of books will be broken down into sections of the United States or sections of North America by climate, things like that. But find one with actual pictures, not drawings, and make sure they have detailed pictures of the tops of the leaves, the bottoms of the leaves, the fruit, and the bark if it's a tree. Without this, there are so many crossovers and wild edibles that you might be eating something that the picture looks like it's safe, but it actually isn't. And above that, if you have someone local that can mentor you, someone that is maybe a little bit older and has, you know, was there when everyone was still eating, eating wild edibles, like we have a couple of people within our group that were around when it was normal to go and pick, uh, you know, wild edibles, you know, pick blackberry, pick things off the the side of the early roads and and the the, uh, the woods. So it's very, it was easier for us to get into it. But if you have someone that can mentor you, just talk with them and ask them to take you through and look at it. What are the top five easiest to find and easiest to identify uh, wild edibles in Florida? Uh, since we're both here. Yeah. In Florida, I would say that um, definitely the fruits were just, you know, there's so many fruits. There's uh, persimmons. Um, we have our, uh, Cattail. Have you ever had cattail? I haven't. No, no. But okay. I, I, you can eat the you can eat the 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 big furry stalk at its young on stages, the top, yep. right? Yep, at its young stages, and its roots have treated properly. Um, there's so there's really so many. I would say that the biggest thing for people to do is just start looking. You know, if you don't start looking around you, and you'll see it. I mean, you've got dandelion growing everywhere. You've got, uh, you know, just stuff that we don't, that we surpass every day. You've got pine needles that you can make pine needle tea with, um, you know, acorns that you can get the acorn nuts from, uh, you've got from pine nuts, you know, you've got from uh, pine cones. There's just so much that if we just start to look around, we'll start to see things that we can eat. But the biggest thing is incorporate them now into your diet. And if you have any specific food allergies or you have any sensitivities to certain things, please either do it under a controlled setting or use the universal edibility test, which will allow you to better your chances of not having a severely adverse reaction when trying something new. And how do you eat cattail root? I'm sorry, what? How do you eat cattail root? Is that you you boil it or? Uh, We've shaved it and boiled it. So shave it down in a small bits and then boil it up and then uh and then you said the top you can eat it when it's when it's not mature that's right yeah if you eat it when it's mature it's, it's just that big fluff ball and no one wants to eat that i guess if you had to you try it but 
you won't get as much nutrition from it. And then uh, any other parts of the cattail that you can eat? Uh, um, not that I haven't found to have a bitter, bitter taste to them. So the stock is bitter. The stock's bitter. Yeah. But again, that might not be the same if you're in a different area of the South, you know, the Southeast. And, uh, you made a video a while back, it's probably two or three years ago. And it, you'd take a cotton balls and, uh, dip them in, in candle wax, leftover candle wax. And, and then that was your fire starter. I took that out. I, I, I went uh, hog hunting, I guess, I guess it was about two years ago. And I did some of those cotton balls that you'd made and I keep them in a little Altoids tin. And, uh, and of course, as every time I go camping, it rains. I don't know if it's a, if it's some kind of a, a curse or karma or something that that's happening, but uh, whatever it is, it, it rains every single time I go camping, and uh, and I was able to build a fire with with uh, uh, like palmetto fronds. I just shook mm-hmm. the because the the water runs right off of them if you shake them, and between that and and like a little half of one of those cotton balls with the wax on it. And that thing burned for several minutes, and it was enough to to just dry out those palm fronds enough to to get a, di- a decent little fire going. And it had been raining like pretty much all day, and it was still drizzling, and I still had a pretty decent fire going. So I, I think that was probably one of the most useful things I have ever found uh, for survival. And it's such a simple solution. And uh, can you give us a couple of more tips that would be that would be uh, on par with with that 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 cotton ball with the wax? for a fire yeah, starter. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of ways our our teaching suggests that fire is life because it's going to allow you to stay warm, signal, cook your food, boil your water. It's going to allow you to do so many different things. So, a lot of our teaching relies on fire. Um another quick one for anyone, I'm sure everyone listening knows about how to make char cloth. Uh char cloth is a cotton or natural material that has been oxidized in a fire, all the oxygen gets released. You're left with a charred bit of material that will catch a spark easily. Uh, you can use this to catch a spark from a, a broken lighter, a uh, ferrocium rod, um, flint and steel, really anything. So if you don't have a container to poke a hole in the top and set over the fire to char your material, you can take your material, like let's just say as an example, a, a corner of a piece of a shirt. You light it on fire, put it on the ground, and put a leaf over top of it. What you're going to do is allow it to smolder out all the other materials, leaving you a mostly charred piece of cloth. And this is going to give you something that you can strike with a uh, ferrocium rod. You can strike with a flint and steel and then put that in a tinder bundle to start a regular fire with. And that you're putting out the world news briefings about every day. And besides right. that, a, approximately once a week, you've got a survival interview. Is that right? Actually, starting just tonight, uh, it's actually twice a week. So every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern, we're bringing on special guests. Mark, I hope you'll come on sometime, and we're discussing uh, current events, the things that people can do now to prepare for an unknown tomorrow, and uh, bringing on people who have actually lived in different environments and went through different skill sets that will help all of the listeners better become prepared for disasters. You had a great interview recently about getting home in a disaster. Can you give us some highlights from that interview? Absolutely. So we had Dixie come on uh, from Homemade Wonderlust on YouTube, and she has hiked the Appalachian Trail. So if anyone doesn't know about the Appalachian Trail, it's a multi-state trail that covers over 2,000 miles, and it took her six months to hike it. Now, of course, this isn't a hard ruck. She wasn't going hard every day, but between 10 and 20 miles a day. Um, she started out not knowing anything about overnight camping. She had never overnight camped before. So she really went gung ho from the start and learned along the way and was able to bring to the listeners a lot of great and useful tips. And, and one of those that, that I try to get out the most is footwear. You know, if you're preparing for a disaster, you see everybody tell you what kind of footwear to buy. Everyone tells you, uh, you know, you really do get what you pay for. I have actually found just the opposite. Now, I have a little bit of wide feet. Um, Everyone needs to take it personally, and they need to just go out and find footwear that works from them. I hike 5 to 10 miles a day in $14 Walmart shoes. And sure, I go through I go through them twice as quick as I would a $60 or $100 pair of shoes, but they're so inexpensive. 
and they fit my foot perfectly. So everyone just needs to get out there and find a shoe that works for them and then buy a couple. And know that if you are moving a lot during the disaster, you're going to blow through your shoes and you're going to need duct tape to repair it. Uh, you know, you're going to need to have extra socks to make sure that you are drying your feet out at night so you don't get, you know, trench rod on your foot. You're going to need to do all these things. So that was one of her big takeaways was footwear. Another one was she and others on the trail had gotten food poisoning and waterborne disease. And so she was able to bring some awareness about that, you know, things that we're just day to day from her in a non survival setting that to our communities in the event of a disaster would become the difference between life and death. And that's like, a, that's a really, really good lesson wrapped up in all of that is uh, you're going to have some failures when you, when you go hiking or you get out and you test your gear or whatever. And it's so much more forgiving right now when the grid's up, when Walmart's still open, uh, when you can go on the Amazon and say, oh, those shoes didn't really work that great for me. Uh, let me try something else and uh, maybe I need to f find a different type of sock. And, and, and all those little lessons that are so inexpensive right now could be life or death in a survival situation. Is that right? Is that a good reason to just get out there and try your stuff and test your theories and and see if those skills that, that you're watching on, on YouTube will, will work for you in your environment? Is that is that a lesson? Yeah, accounting for failure in your preparation is definitely a must. You know, we when we work with someone and we help them build a kit or or prepare their family we ask them about their items and we'll ask to see them. We're, you know, we'll walk through their items with them. And almost 90% of the time, the items will have zero to very little use on them. And what that says, unless they have a backup that they've been using, unless they can show us the actual used item next to it, is that they haven't got out there and worked with their gear. So they don't know what happens when it fails. They don't know if they're only relying on one knife and that knife breaks, they don't know what to do. They're stuck. If they're only relying on one water filter and they don't know how long to boil water for, they're stuck without a, a water purification option. So if you don't account for these types of failures and look for ways to fix them in the field, then you're going to be stuck that much worse off during a disaster. So I want to absolutely recommend that everybody goes to Full Spectrum Survival, find the YouTube channel, subscribe, and watch – the world news briefing every night because you're going to get five, in five minutes, you're going to get more news than you're going to get in a week of watching Fox and, and, uh, the rest of the puppet shows out there. So, uh, definitely do that. Um, these interviews are just fantastic. Great, great information on there. Now, do are you, do, do you do some consulting as well? You said you're helping people put together kits. Is that something you do in the, in the Tampa area? We do, but more likely, you know, we just do it on a case by case basis as people need help. We don't even charge them for it. You know, just let's get together. And it's my, I feel it's my outreach and my mission in life to kind of make sure that as enough people are prepared so that when a disaster does strike, not if it strikes, when it does, they can help others. And then to contact you, they just go to fullspectrum.com. And do you have contact information listed on the website? Yeah, they can email at fullspectrumsurvival at gmail.com or go to fullspectrumsurvival.com and use the contact page there or message me on YouTube or really anything. Brad, thanks so much for making time for us today. Thank you, and thank you everyone for listening. After a massive wave of disappearances, 26-year-old CIA analyst Everett Carroll finally believes what he's been told about the biblical prophecy of the rapture. Global currencies have collapsed, famine and plague have claimed the lives of millions, and the world has crumbled into chaos. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials of God's wrath are about to be poured out upon the earth, and woe to the inhabitants thereof. Of. Buy your copy of The Days of Elijah, Book One, Apocalypse, by best-selling author Mark Goodwin, in paperback or Kindle edition from Amazon.com today.